Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Peace Proposal Webinar, organized by Soka Gakkai Malaysia SGM to discuss the topic on environmental and climate change. My name is Robin Wu, your MC for this event. To start, I'd like to thank our participants for taking time and effort to attend this webinar on a weekend. We hope the insights and discussions can assist you to better understand the issue, inspire future research, and motivate change. Our guest speakers today include Professor Dr. Sumiyani Binti Yusuf, the Director for the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences in University Malaya. Mr. Benjamin Ongja Ming, Head Exploration at UNDP Malaysia's Accelerator Lab. And last but not the least, Ms. Tan Chai Mei, an active member of the Malaysian Youth Delegation, MYD. This session will be moderated by Dr. Wendy Yimei Tian, the Director of the Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment, CITRA, from the University of Malaya. Dr. Wendy Yi will also be sharing with us Mr. Daisaku Ikeda's peace proposal concerning environmental and climate change. Passing on the spotlight, please welcome Dr. Wendy Yi. Thank you very much, Rubin. Once again, a very warm welcome and a very good morning to all participants joining us in today's peace proposal webinar on environmental and climate change. This is indeed a very important topic and an essential topic that all humanity needs to focus our actions on. As introduced by Rubin today, we are very privileged to have three very distinguished speakers on board, sharing with us their expertise, their amazing experiences and their aspirations on what humanity can do in tackling the climate change and environmental issues. But before I introduce them to you in greater detail, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you a little background on why this topic on climate change is so crucial and critical even more so in the next decade. I would like to make reference to the COVID-19 pandemic, which had just happened and which has awakened humanity that even a nanoscale small virus can have enormous negative impact on the entire humanity. So as we can see, when the pandemic hit, it hits people from all walks of life, regardless of rich or poor, disregarding national borders, ethnic identity, or even religious affiliation. So no one is immune, and we know that no one is safe until everyone and everywhere is safe. Hence, the emergence of this pandemic has changed people's perception of risk and our behavior in dealing with this little threat. And as this COVID pandemic comes along, we have SOPs in place to avoid infection, and everyone knows what measures we need to take to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. But the irony that dawned upon me is why in the case of climate change, why are people acting indifferently, although climate change is also affecting the entire global humanity? Is the threat of climate change less lethal as compared to the COVID-19 pandemic? Absolutely not. So what lessons have humanity learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? According to a recent report published by ProPublica, Scientists warn that a catastrophic loss in biodiversity, reckless destruction of wildland, and warming temperatures have allowed diseases to explode. In fact, scientists who study how diseases emerge in, an, in a changing environment, they actually knew this moment was coming. So climate change is making outbreaks of diseases more common and more dangerous. So ignoring the connection between climate change and pandemics would be a dangerous delusion. So by now, we all realize that nature is trying to tell us something, that the destruction brought about by climate change is real, and there is an intimate and delicate relationship between all living species and the environment. So according to the United Nations, uh, General Secretary uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, he said, climate-related natural disasters are becoming more frequent more deadly, more destructive with growing human and financial costs. So hurricanes, hit, and he even mentioned that hurricanes and other storms are likely to become stronger. Floods and droughts will become more common, and some regions will even experience more severe drought, increasing the risk of wildfires, lost crops, and drinking water shortages. 
So as we can see, the entire ecosystem will continue to change and the earth is running a risk of extinction of over 1 million species of plants and animals, including polar bears. In addition, climate change is clearly threatening the potential of food security, water security, human health, the, and the social fabric of humanity, leading to countries at war over scarce resources. And these things are already happening before our eyes. So in the General Assembly of the United Nations held last year in 2019, General Assembly President Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces shared a shocking reality of climate change with the world leaders. And I quote, just over a decade is all that remains to stop irreversible damage from climate change. And we are the last generation that can prevent irreparable damage to our planet, unquote. So to tackle this worldwide crisis and its manifold consequences is truly a test of our humanity. And it depends and it demands international cooperation, multilateral solutions, and a global solidarity. So echoing this urgent call for action, Dr. Daisako Ikeda, the third president of the Soka Gakai, has written a peace proposal entitled Towards Our Shared Future, constructing an era of human solidarity to the United Nations on 26th of January this year. In fact, Dr. Ikeda has been writing annual peace proposal to the United Nations since 1983, addressing issues on education reform, the environment, the United Nations, and nuclear abolition. So for this year, the main themes of the peace proposal are climate action and nuclear weapons abolition, with a focus on the individual lives and suffering of the hidden behind macroeconomic indices. So parallel to the theme of today's webinar, I would like to share with you the summary of this peace proposal related to issues on climate change and suggestions for action in building a sustainable society in which all people can live with dignity and a sense of security. At the opening of his peace proposal, Dr. Ikeda made a very powerful remark, and I quote, Climate change is more than an environmental issue in the conventional understood sense. It represents a threat to all people living on Earth, both now and in future generations. It is like nuclear weapons, a fundamental challenge on which the fate of humankind hinges." Unquote. He also pointed out that climate change issues are directly impacting other social issues affecting humanity, such as poverty and hunger. So making global efforts to eliminate poverty and hunger as set up in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, very difficult and meaningless if we do not resolve issues related to climate change. So climate change is an issue that will leave no one untouched, just like the COVID-19 pandemic. However, it is also important to realize that climate change has this potential to catalyze unseen global solidarity and action so therefore, the world's success or failure in actualizing this potential is in fact the defining issue of our time. So in this peace proposal, Dr. Ikeda discusses the elements required for a vigorous and strong solidarity of action from the perspective of three commitments by global actors. Firstly, leave no one behind. So this is the first commitment is to never leave behind those struggling in difficult circumstances. Because in recent years, we can see the scale of damage brought by natural disasters created widespread impacts affecting both developed and developing countries, especially people from the more vulnerable sectors of society, including people living at the coastal line. The tragic impact of climate change has forced displacement of these people, and they may never be able to return to their homes because of the rising sea levels. So the loss of land is equivalent to a fundamental loss of identity. And the pain compounded by the sudden loss of friends and family due to the rising sea levels can be truly unbearable. So responding to this depth of anguish is imperative for society as a whole. So Dr. Ikeda suggested that attentiveness to this kind of, irre of this irre irreparable pain, I'm sorry, must be the part of any effort to tackle climate change. So humanity must realize that the world is a realm of shared living, 
And the basis of shared living is found in an appreciation that people who live under the shadow of severe threats are essentially no different from ourselves. So therefore, in this peace proposal, Dr. Ikeda proposed that when we consider global issues, our first and foremost focus must be on the threats presented to the lives, the livelihood and the dignity of individual human beings. So to generate a global solidarity of action to confront the challenge of climate change, we must have the commitment never to abandon those who find themselves in dire circumstances. Now, the second commitment Dr. Ikeda emphasized is the challenge of construction, which highlights the importance of taking actions. He emphasized the importance of taking joint and constructive actions rather than just communicating a sense of crisis. We need to put forward a clear vision around which we can come together in solidarity, collectively, and take proactive measures towards the construction of that reality. As such, the SGI, the Sokogaka International, has organized exhibitions entitled Seeds of Change and Seeds of Hope. And these titles encapsulate the message that every one of us, starting from where we are right now, has the potential to become an architect of change for a sustainable global society and that our every action is indeed a seed of change and a seed of hope that will bloom into flowers of dignity throughout the world. So reflecting upon the Green Belt Movement founded by Dr. Wangari Matai, which, be, which be began with the planting of just seven saplings, which has now grown to 51 million trees in, in Kenya, excuse me. So Dr. Matai asserted, I quote, even though we think that the particular action at an individual level may be very small, but just imagine if it's repeated several million times, it will make a difference, unquote. So her words give us so much powerful, you know, sense of joy that comes from engaging in this challenge of construction. Now, the final third commitment that Dr. Ikeda highlighted in his peace proposal is youth-led climate action. So it is crucial to make the next 10 years a decade of climate action by young people as an integral element of the United Nations Decade of Action to deliver the SDGs by 2030. It will be crucial to hold a gathering of youth representatives from around the world to give world leaders an opportunity to listen to the views of the next generation. The young people understand the implications of climate change towards their life and they know it is possible to address it. So Dr. Pite, the co-founder of the Club of, Club of Rome, said, I quote, listening to the voices of young people is neither optional nor merely the better choice. It is the only logical path forward, a step we cannot skip if we genuinely concern about the future of our world, unquote. So he emphasized the importance of affording the younger generations more opportunities to take action and to exercise their powers of imagination and leadership. So in this peace proposal, Dr. Ikeda proposed that the Youth Climate Summit to be held every year to create a new trajectory for the United Nations. And the United Nations needs to work closely with civil society to promote a wide range of activities and to include youth everywhere to take the lead in combating climate change. And as United Nations celebrates its 75th anniversary of its founding this month, Dr. Ikeda proposed that the world's young people should be invited to participate as key partners. So in conclusion, Dr. Ikeda has highlighted that the path to resolving the problems of climate change and achieving the SDGs will not be smooth or easy. However, he is deeply confident that as long as there is solidarity among the youth, there is no impasse that we cannot surmount. And he said, I quote, it is my belief that protecting the human rights and future development of the next generation is the cornerstone of creating a sustainable global society, unquote. So with that, I conclude my summary of Dr. Ikeda's 2020 peace proposal focusing on climate change. So with this background, we now have a clearer picture and why we choose environment and climate change as the key focus of our webinar today. Like I've mentioned earlier, we have three very distinguished panelists and trust me, they have so much more to share with us on this topic based on their very rich experiences and each of them will be sharing from a different perspective related to climate change. And now it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Benjamin Ong. Mr. Benjamin is the head of exploration of UNDP Malaysia Accelerator Lab. He holds a master's in sustainable development from the University of St. Andrews. 
between 2014 and 19, he anchored the student volunteer engagement and environmental education at the University of Malaya's Rimba Ilmu Botanic Garden through two platforms that he personally founded, that is the Rimba Project and the Urban Biodiversity Initiative. Benjamin's interest centered on the relationship between humans and nature in cities and on the power and agency of student volunteerism. His interdisciplinary collaborators have included the United Nations University, International Institute for Global Health, Badan Warisan Malaysia, and Google Earth Outreach. And he had delivered a talk entitled Making Peace with Urban Wildlife in conjunction with SGM Months of Sustainable Development way back in 2018. And the topic that Benjamin will be sharing with us today is the things that make for peace. Benjamin, the screen is yours. Benjamin, you need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, I muted there. Um, morning, everyone. And uh, thanks, um, thanks, Wendy, for the kind introduction. Um, you know, it's interesting how uh, things have changed so much that now you say the screen is yours instead of the floor is yours. <laughs> All right, um, please allow me to share. I hope everyone can see this. You can see my slides, right? So um, it's it's nice to be back here. Uh, thank you, um, SGM, for you know welcoming me back uh, after two years, um, albeit in a slightly different uh, you know um, affiliation now. So I used to say that um, I used to be affiliated to UM University of Malaya, and now I'm with uh, the UN. So I've just you know changed one letter difference. Um, I'm now the head of exploration at uh, the new UN Deep Accelerator Lab, and I'll introduce that shortly. Um, and uh, how I would like to just spend the next 15 minutes um, is to anchor uh, you know, our discussion in one concept uh, to discuss what I consider to be two you know, challenging principles or properties of the world we live in. Um, and, and finally, to also consider some of the things that, uh, you know, that we can do, um, especially uh, from a UNDP perspective. So, you know, this, this, this really began uh, with Dr. Ikeda's uh, peace proposal, right? And um, I thought that that was something worth uh, dwelling upon, this concept of peace. Um, and uh, Wendy, you mentioned that, uh, you know, this, is, this month, the United Nations celebrates its 75th anniversary. Um, so, you know, it's really quite a momentous occasion. Uh, we've been around for 75 years. And I thought it was worth just looking back to, you know, the origins of the United Nations. Uh, which, you know, I don't know how many of us actually know this, but the UN was established after World War II with the aim, among others, uh, of preventing future wars, because we all know, you know, how devastating uh, World War II was back in 1945. Um, and in the three quarters of the century that it's been operating, uh, you know, it's worked through various kinds of agencies, uh, from, um, you know, the UNHCR, Refugee Agency, all the way to UNICEF, uh, Children's Fund. Uh, but at the heart of it, and this is a question that we always get, you know, like, uh, all these other agencies tend to be more, more public and more public face. So where does UNDP come in? Um, so allow me to just plug a bit in there. Uh, at its heart, human development is needed to eradicate the inequalities, you know, the fundamental inequalities that make for conflict. Um, and in, in many ways, UNDP works behind the scenes very closely with governments um, in over 170 countries and territories uh, to, to work out these root issues um, in society and environment um, and so on, uh, you know, so that we can prevent conflict. But the understanding of development has changed over time. Uh, and those of you who have been following the work of the UN, you know that every, you know, 10, 15 years or so, there's a different slogan. And now we are in this uh, era of uh, sustainable development. And some of you may have heard of the sustainable development goals um, that runs roughly from 2015 until 2030. Before this, there was the MDGs or the Millennium De uh, Development Goals. So models change, but the mission remains the same. Um, this, is, this is one way to, to kind of understand it. Um, so again, this is uh, the triple bottom line version of sustainable development, which looks at the environment, economy, society. And basically the principle is when these three are in balance, you know, then we'll have a prosperous, we'll have a you know, happy a society, lots of well-being, peace, and so on. Um, I drew dotted lines here also to three uh, sectors of society that also need to be in this equilibrium from the public sector, government, private interests and enterprise and civil society, basically the rest of us. And, you know, if we, if we look at this, basically 
when all these are in balance and harmony, then we can have peace. Usually when there's a conflict, it's because one or more of these elements are not in balance. So, you know, for instance, if you pursue societal development and economic growth, but you neglect the environment, uh, then you'll have problems. You set yourself uh, to vulnerable, uh, you know, to issues uh, that, that will then come back and, and cause you problems. This is another modeling of it, you know, that, that, that uh, goes a step further and argues that um, really the environment, society and economy are not equal partners, so to speak. Uh, the economy sits within society and society sits within the environment. And, you know, this is the argument made, uh, you know, uh, that we must first protect our environment before we pursue, uh, you know, societal development or economic growth. Of course, these continue to be debated, but, you know, just looking at the general logic, you can see how it makes sense. Um, you know, if, if you've got a flood happening outside, and you know, some of you may have seen, you know, Masi Jamik became Venice uh, in, uh, you know, last week, couple of weeks. If you've got a flood out there, you can't do anything. You, you can't go to school, you can't, uh, you know, you can't go about your business. So you can forget about societal growth and economic growth if your environment is in peril. If I were to ask you what's the 16th of September, all of you will say Malaysia Day, and you're right. Uh, but it's also World Ozone Day, you know. So um, and this is this is something that you can't really do uh, in a webinar. You know, I would if this was a live event, I would have you know asked everyone to raise their hands. Who knew it was World Ozone Day as well as Malaysia Day? Um, and as I was thinking about it, actually, it kind of makes sense, right? Because one of the things that we all share as Malaysians, regardless where we are in the country, is the atmosphere, the ozone. So it was it was you know it was good. Um, thought to have, you know, on this, uh, you know, this anniversary uh, of, the, of the World Ozone Day. Um, and uh, UNDP has been working behind the scenes with uh, the government of Malaysia to implement the Montreal Protocol uh, to phase out uh, the chemicals that, you know, deplete the ozone layer. Um, and this is the, an example of the kind of work that's been done for the last, uh, you know, close to 70 years by UNDP in Malaysia, a lot of it behind the scenes. But where I come in is that I'm a part of a new network of 60 accelerator labs, right, embedded in UNDP country teams across the world. So just uh, last year, UNDP decided to set up uh, the accelerator labs, which is a new program, which is a new service that it is providing to its host countries um, that aims to shift right, this working from being behind the scenes to what we call working out loud a bit more, creating more opportunities for participation. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, UNDP is present in about 170 over uh, countries and territories. And now 60 of these uh, have accelerator labs. We're gonna add another 30 soon. And the accelerator labs uh, generally work by introducing these uh, principles into our work, sensing, exploring, testing, um, and growing. And you know, I'll, I'll summarize this basically by saying that we are going out there to really look at how challenges present themselves in the local context Right, because you know you may say that oh, you've got uh, you know you've got deforestation, but deforestation doesn't happen the same in all countries. It doesn't happen the same in all states in Malaysia as well. So gaining this perspective from you know the actual co local context is very important, and it will help us to fo decide where to focus our attention. It's also to connect more with communities and society out there, to look at how everyone is addressing the problems they face. Uh, sometimes through official means, but more importantly, through unofficial or community strategies. And then to design tests and to figure out what works and what doesn't. Basically, we're moving away from a very monolithic model of, you know, trickle down effect, government decides everything and so on, and finding ways to create more, you know, what we call multimodal, multinodal, uh, you know, modes of, of addressing the problems we face. Because as you know, um, problems are accelerating at a rate, uh, you know, faster, uh, then we can catch up in many ways. Um, you may ask, why is it that we need a learning network? Why now, at this point in, in human history? Um, why not 50 years ago? But it's because in the last few years, I mean, I would say at least five or 10 years, um, there's a greater understanding that the world is a very complex place and people, you and me, are, are ultimately irrational. So here I am on a Sunday morning, you know, saying that we're all irrational beings, right? And, uh, you know, that we don't make decisions based on common sense or logic and things like that. Bear with me. Uh, I'm not here to insult everyone, but I'll explain, uh, you know, what I mean by this. Now, consider this. Um, everyone knows what it is, right? Plastic bottle, water. 
uh, you know, if you are one of those, you know, hardcore environmentalists, you look at this and immediately you think, oh, you know, this is the embodiment of evil. You know, we should, you know, say no to plastics. But I want you to consider something. It is all of these and more. Uh, you know, in some uh, posters you might have seen, it's you know, killer of marine wildlife, right? You know, plastics in the sea. But in certain settings, it could be a lifesaver, being you know, a, a vessel to hold clean, portable drinking water uh, in, in some settings and environments. And also, um, if you think about it, it's a tree protector. Okay? How can plastics protect trees? Now, if plastics weren't invented, and this has been argued, we would probably lose a lot more of our forests because we would have needed more paper, pulp, and wood, you know, to build things that have since been replaced by plastics. You know, so if you were to look at a different world where you know oil and gas never gave us plastics, a lot of things we take for granted, maybe like furniture, you know, maybe like uh, even stationary pens and so on. Uh, you know, even what we use sanitizer bottles today, we use glass, and you know, who knows where we would get those from? Mining would certainly be bigger than it may have been today. Or consider this, um, you know, airplanes, right? I don't know what this symbolizes to you. Uh, from an environmental perspective, we look at this and say, oh, you know, gigantic, uh, you know, carbon emitter, right? You know, uh, airplanes are evil. But in many ways, airplanes also represent these things, right? Uh, holidays, how many of us have, uh, you know, enjoyed uh, holidays, whether domestically or, or internationally, because we've been able to fly. And if those holidays then, you know, lead to better mental health, is it worth the price of the carbon? Business, business opportunities that re result in growth, result in income generation and jobs. Is it worth the carbon that is emitted? Also, and more interestingly, it can be argued that the network of uh, aviation flight connections accelerated the spread of coronavirus. Um, and you know, studies have been made on this and what has been found and uh, published in Fortune magazine is that Really, um, the world is no longer geographical in the sense of the distance between countries right, on the globe, but the distance between countries as a function of you know, how, how easy it is to get from one place to another. So if you can see this map here, you know, it, it, it links the epicenter, the original epicenter of COVID, Wuhan uh, in China, right, to, of course, uh, major Chinese cities. But then from Shanghai, there's, you know, the, the distance to KL, London, and LA are almost the same even though we know that you know, it's much closer to KL. But this is uh, you know, calculated in terms of the number of flights, the number of passengers that go from one place to another. And this is one reason among others why South America was hit very badly, because of its connections to Spain and from Spain to China. In the initial stages, of course, we know by now that you know, um, the epicenter has changed. It's no longer in China. Right? Other countries in the world have, have taken over. But this is an example of the complexity, the complex world that we live in. And uh, you know, the issues, they don't have to make sense of this. All I want to show in this slide is that things are interrelated, interconnected. And, you know, it's, it's not always easy to, uh, to escape, uh, you know, from one issue. You can't just say that, okay, you know, flights are good, flights are bad. They come with a huge mixed bag of both good and bad. Um, and it's, what is important is to be cognizant, right, of, you know, what are some of the unintended consequences that may happen as a result of our actions. So I've got a quick poll, um, and I think uh, Chung Bin, you might have the poll. Um, if you could just, uh, yeah, thank you. If everyone could just quickly answer this. Um, yeah, I would like to see uh, what the answers are like. And I I'll give you only 20 seconds. I don't want this to take too long. <laughs> Okay, I think we can stop it at 30 seconds, so another five seconds. Okay, stop. And only half have voted, but all right, great. So to the seven who answered, 8% uh, answered zero, you're right. <laughs> the answer is you, th th there is no net energy saved. Um, and you know, we can go into this in a lot more detail, I won't. But the principle is you may save money on your bill, but you're not actually going to make any difference to the energy being generated by the power plant somewhere far from your home. You know? And the, the concept behind this is that individual actions right, don't make the kind of difference that you think it does unless those inter, in, in individual actions come together in a much larger collective. 
So I think I'll skip this. Um, you know, it's just a uh, further explanation of the same. But uh, you know, you can come back uh, to this. I think if the slides will be shared, I want to show that a lot of times, you know, uh, environmental action needs to be at the meeting point of what is right, desirable, convenient, but also practical. Some, you know, a couple of years uh, there was this talk about phasing out single-use plastics. You know, but when you think about it, it's so pervasive. Um, it ranges from things that we don't need, right, like boba tea, but which everybody's lining up for, down to things like wrapping bread, which is kind of like really um, bread and butter, something that we take for granted, essential for keeping things clean and fresh. So how do we make these things uh, not only desirable, but also practical? There is a good paper here in Nature by Nielsen, Griggs and Visbeck, again, on looking at the trade-offs between goals. But I would like to draw attention to the second part of what I said earlier about irrationality, right? Um, and how in many ways we act based on what we think is right, the stories that drive our behavior. I won't name names, but there is a university somewhere in the Klang Valley where on two sides of one path, there were these two different interpretations of a garden. On the right was a butterfly garden with a lot of diversity of plants. On the left was just one species cut very neatly. And uh, I've been told that senior management of this university ordered that the butterfly garden be removed and made more like the garden on the left because they wanted it to be neat rather than to have a good function for the environment. Um, this was inspired, of course, by you know, traditional European gardens that look very neat. But even in Europe, the move is away from the so-called neat gardens towards gardens that bring life. And a lot of times, our values shape the decisions that we make. Um, and, you know, dealing with problems in the real world is messy. So this is something that I think uh, my co-panelists will talk further about, that decisions in the future must be made from the point of view of those who will inherit the future, but also that what works in theory may not work in practice. And this is very important to note because environmental initi experimental initiatives platforms, um, you know, such as Living Labs, can help us to navigate this complexity and build resilience. Problems are never always uh, straightforward. I'd like to close with just three very quick points of action and something to note. Um, one, in helping to build uh, learnings around the problems we face, UNDP has set up a platform called Collective Intelligence. So just bear in mind this website, collectiveintelligence.my, um, and check it out. And we hope to really build more perspectives from across society so that we can understand the issues we face with greater depth and diversity. The second, is to help us by being a solution scout. If you could just take this URL here, short URL at MOHL1, uh, or you know, screen capture the, uh, uh, the QR code. Um, we would like you to join us and also look at the ways that people are coping with the issues that they face, the in innovative ways that they are dealing with everyday problems and share those with us, what you find. And thirdly, um, very quickly, uh, um, we're launching a writing competition um, that will run throughout next month in October, dwelling and thinking and reflecting on uh, post-COVID futures. So um, Think City is our implementing partner here, and um, you can see Think City's uh, social media handles below. Uh, follow Think City for updates, and we hope that you can participate in this. Um, in closing, I'd like to say that you know, as we head into an increasingly uncertain future, we need to be more flexible, adaptable. Uh, we need to dialogue more and we need to embrace diversity rather than, you know, single point, uh, you know, best fit solutions, because arguably there may be none. So, um, you know, as we think uh, for the future and from point of view of youth and the decisions we will make, let us also think about, you know, the kind of idealism we may have. Uh, to what extent will we be able to carry this uh, faithfully to the very end? Thank you. You can keep in touch. Um, that's the accelerator lab email. Okay, Thank you very much. A couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your um, very interesting and very insightful, uh, you know, expertise and experiences with us. And I think you mentioned one thing very important is you actually talk about 
balance you know how do we strike a balance and you also talk about you know this irrationality that you know human beings are so again it goes back to the question of how do we strike that balance and how do we achieve that balance and and as we tackle these issues on environmental you know uh, or climate change i think achieving that balance and understanding this whole idea of interdisciplinary is really important and crucial so once again thank you very much benjamin and i'm sure we have a uh, you know a, a couple of questions coming from the audience but we'll keep that to the very end and I would like I would now like to proceed to the second speaker for today uh, so our second speaker is Professor Sumiani uh, she's no stranger to me definitely and of course uh, Prof Sumiani is definitely the icon and trademark of sustainable development or SDG in University Malaya now Prof Sumiani is actually the director for the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences in University Malaya and she's also the chairperson of the Secretariat of UM Eco Campus and UM Living Lab and being very passionate about reducing the carbon footprint in University of Malaya, Professor Sumeni is also the principal coordinator for UM Zero Waste campaign. So without further ado, Prof Sumeni, the screen is yours. Prof, you need to unmute your mic. Hi, good morning, everyone. Sorry, I always forget that. Yeah. Um, so nice to be here with you all uh, in this glorious Sunday morning. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wendy, for the kind introduction. And um, uh, I think uh, I'm happy uh, to be involved with uh, this program. And I think it's very timely and it's so apt uh, since we know that uh, you know, the repercussions and also the implications of uh, climate change will definitely have uh, severe ramifications uh, towards peace and also um, uh, the stability of not just the um, environment but also in terms of uh, human survival. Uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, some of my thoughts and also some of the things that we do or the initiatives that we do in University Malaya just to give, give a glimpse on um, uh, how collective effort eh, could actually uh, be geared uh, towards uh, improving or at least supporting our national or your even your institutional uh, climate change agenda. Because as rightly said by Benjamin earlier, uh, it is actually a collective effort. Yeah, No one single person uh, could actually uh, do uh, things uh, efficiently or effectively. But having said that, um, I always believe that um, every one of us have got this uh, should have this conviction and also should actually uh, be ready to play our role uh, because if we continue with our laser fair attitude, yeah, uh, we are not just uh, heading towards uh, more destruction, uh, but um, we'll be actually facing more severe consequences in the future. Eh? So I'm going to share with you my screen and um, I'm going to take you through uh, to what we do and also as I'm coming from the academia, uh, I would actually like to actually highlight the role of universities uh, and this uh, doesn't just limit to universities, it could also be applied to institutions yeah, uh, and entities in adapting to climate change. Yeah? So there are quite a number of slides, so I'll be quite uh, talking quite fast, uh, but nevertheless the slides are there for you to uh, refer to uh, in the future, uh, I think the organizer will be sharing with you if uh, you, need, you need it. So I'm going to take you through to some of the uh, introduction of climate change, which I'm not going to go too into detail because Dr. Wendy has done a good job uh, earlier uh, in the introduction session on the importance and the relevance of climate change and how everyone should actually play their role. Uh, because as you know, uh, in this uh, current situation, whilst we are facing so many challenges, uh, so many environmental uh, effects due to our anthropogenic activities, uh, climate change is certainly to me the most defining issue of our time. And we are certainly at a defining moment yeah? because uh, the uh, implications of uh, impacts of climate change uh, are so diverse 
and so encompassing, which will actually uh, impact us not just through uh, shifting weather patterns that could threaten food production, rising sea levels, increase of you know catastrophic flooding, uh, and so many other things. The climate change impact are actually global in scope and unprecedented in scale. So without drastic action today, adapting to these impacts in the future will be more difficult and more costly. And um, then I will take you through to UM's effort and how we do it. So this is just basically the background, a uh, lot of things there. But of course, like I said, uh, there's so many uh, references and resources for you to look, look at uh, for uh, any one of you interested to know further about the, the effect and also the causes of climate change. Basically, in short, it is due to human activities, although some people uh, uh, you know, argue that it is a natural process, but of obviously from scientific data and record, you know that over the years, especially since the intervention and also the uh, human activities since uh, industrial revolution, and also due to the increased activities, which actually use a lot of uh, fuels for our uh, daily uh, consumption, production, and so on, it has actually uh, created uh, this vast amount of um, carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases uh, that is actually um, uh, you know, causing the, this encapsulation of uh, these gases that increases the uh, red, uh, infrared uh, radiation uh, that cannot be uh, di redirected. So due to the uh, increase in uh, temperature or also climate change that can actually be uh, happening due to the human intervention. We have seen many evidences of um, rapid climate change, uh, right from you know um, erratic weather patterns, higher temperatures, uh, uh, more severe weather patterns, you know, melting of polar ice. So all these have, have been reported. And I think even this year uh, with uh, the COVID issue, we have a lot of um, reports on temperature, uh, increasing temperature that leads to forest fires yeah, that's happening, severe droughts and so on. So, um, and, and uh, this is not just a, a prediction, uh, but, you know, from historical data, uh, it is very, very uh, pertinent for us to understand that um, uh, scientists and everyone around has actually, uh, especially uh, people who are concerned, have been monitoring and uh, I think since industrial revolution uh, through uh, records, we have actually emitted more than 375 billion tons of CO2. Yeah? And as of uh, now, uh, annual global CO2 emission has reached 37.1 gigatons right in 2017. So uh, this, this figure is, is ever increasing as long as we do not take drastic action and it will have severe implications. So very important facts about climate change that we need to know. Of course, like I said, the, the, there will be many uh, ramifications, adverse impacts. Yeah, But of course, one of the most uh, defining issues that uh, we are facing now is the, the risk uh, or the threat of rising sea levels because uh, it is anticipated global sea levels could be about one meter higher in 2100. And more than 40% of humanity uh, which is equivalent to about 2.4 billion people living around uh, within the 100 kilometers of coast, yeah, and uh, will be affected. Even in Malaysia, uh, it is anticipated, you know, coastal areas, especially um, uh, cities, yeah, like Kota Kinabalu, uh, Kuching, uh, Pera, Pera, Kedah, you know, uh, the coastal communities will be affected, and there could be at least uh, migration. Uh, due to the displacement of these people. And of course, uh, other issues related to climate calamities. Yeah? So uh, unfortunately, even though there has been commitment from countries and there's been pledges, including Malaysia, where uh, in 2015 itself, we have actually pledged yeah, uh, reduction in carbon intensity up to 45%. Uh, uh, it is actually uh, anticipated that uh, even though there's been you know, many commitments from countries pledging to limit the climate crisis, we are still nowhere near enough to stave off record high temperatures. And uh, delaying it will make it impossible to reach the desired temperature goal. So the whole world community is actually trying to 
uh, limit, yeah, the temperature increase within 1.5 to 2 degrees because this is considered the safe level. Yeah, although 1.5 uh, degrees is preferable, but uh, you know, with the uh, amount of activities and emissions that we are still producing at the current rate, temperatures are expected to rise 3.2 degrees Celsius by 2100. And the time for rapid and transformational change to limit global warming is actually now. Yeah? Because otherwise, uh, from records and also from simulations by uh, models, anything above 2 degrees will be disastrous. Yeah? So climate change will have many impacts. Yeah? And um, even now, um, you know, it has been recorded that you know, there's rising temperatures, uh, erratic weather patterns, increase in uh, vector-borne diseases, production of crop affected, pollution and pollen seasons, and you know, there's so many things. And also it's anticipated more than a quarter billion of deaths from diseases in 2030. Okay, and in Malaysia alone, yeah, studies by our top uh, research uh, uh, social scientist, Professor Dr. Raja Rasya says that, you know, Malaysia, a cumulative cost of climate change for Malaysia without climate control could reach up to 40 trillion in a 100 year period. So you know, this is really a time to take action and uh, for everyone to take notice of the little things, even though that, you know, it might not, you might feel it is insignificant. To me, collectively, it would actually uh, lead to better uh, management and also better control. Yeah. So the effect of climate change beyond extends beyond environmental impacts because it is a complex intersection. Huh? which relates to economic, social development and security. And we know that the impacts of fluctuation, uh, fluctuating climate condition or societal instability, especially, uh, could lead to potential uh, violent conflicts. Yeah? And also um, uh, 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 people displacement of people and migration yeah? that could actually stress a lot of uh, social, environmental, and also economic uh, situations. So, I'm not going to go into the SDGs. I think everyone is familiar. The 17 uh, goals that UN has actually uh, strived for everyone to uh, support yeah, with the 769 targets and 230 indicators it can be a bit overwhelming. But at the end of the day, the gist of the SDG goal is actually trying to transform the world for the 2030 agenda so that we actually strike a balance for the uh, well-being of people, planet, prosperity, partnership, and peace. And we have a specific SDG 16, uh, which actually uh, stresses on peace, justice, and strong institutions. So this shows the importance of the social pillar uh, towards uh, the uh, achieving of the global uh, SDG goal. And I believe, uh, to me, uh, when we actually want to do things, especially to improve the environmental condition, there is actually another dimension that we need to look at, which is the sejahtera or spirituality aspect. So I, I, I fully support um, Tan Sri uh, Zul, who is actually the uh, current uh, rector of uh, UIA, who says that the SDG goal should actually incorporate another uh, uh, aspect or another tenet, which is spirituality. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do, if you believe in your conviction and you know that it is actually a requirement, especially from a religious perspective, we being appointed as Khalifa or vice current, uh, we have to actually uh, uh, take care of the environment because vice current denotes that human being does not come to this world without a purpose. And we have to uh, have this moral responsibility to safeguard the earth and the environment. And it's all in, indicated in the, in the uh, Holy Quran for the Muslims, and I think from all other religious perspectives too, has actually emphasizes in the uh, importance of environmental conservation and preservation. So coming to the perspective of university, why it's so important for university or institutions to actually uh, play its role. Uh, there are more than 400 uh, private universities, more than 10,000 schools, more than 20 public universities, and each and every one of us have got activities and initiatives and uh, we do emit greenhouse gases and we could actually do so much more in terms of uh, strengthening our effort towards reduce, reducing climate change. And we play a very important role. Education for sustainable development is actually a, a long-standing uh, commitment 
towards improving uh, not just in uh, giving and disseminating knowledge but also trying to educate our future generation our future leaders to be mindful to be responsible citizens of the world yeah so esd or education for sustainable development for a uh, basic philosophy will actually generate and disseminate knowledge values and behaviors which would integrate environmental economic and societal developments uh, to the future generation so we have a specific uh, secretariat that looks after um uh, initiative for eco campus and we call them living lab yeah so i happen to actually be the uh, chairperson uh, of the living lab and also secretariat of uh, sustainability of um where we try to actually coordinate collate plan implement and ensure that you know it is embedded uh, into our um, university's operation and uh, make it a cultural change and uh, um living lab is basically a grant program yeah which is an it is an action oriented translational research that provides sustainable solutions and how we do it we plan through our eight core areas which is actually in line with the 17 sdg goal so we focus on landscape and biodiversity so that's where ben happened to be one of the pioneer of the rimba project that deals with landscape and biodiversity in um and we have uh, waste management uh, my zero waste campaign uh, tries to set a sustainable and integrated waste management to reduce carbon footprint and reduce cost and generate income and create social development there's water management energy transportation green procurement education management and change management and i always say that any institution could actually adopt the same uh, criteria or the same tenets to actually achieve uh, sustainability or reduce your environmental burden so we have a lot of programs i'm just going to flip through uh, quickly to show you what are the projects that we have so we have multiple programs uh, to support the eight trust areas so remember as you look at number one is the, the the pioneer the most significant project in terms of biodiversity conservation and reconciling cities and natures and we have many many other projects related to that tenant so this is how you go about uh, plan do check act so waste management my zero waste campaign transform our food and green waste to make it uh, into a, a reusable uh, resource which is an uh, organic compost and now we have also extended our project to urban farming and we produce our own urban organic vegetable which is actually uh, uh, used by our residents and also our cafeterias so it, it promotes circular economy and we have so many other projects related to waste management or sustainable waste management i can't go through them uh, in detail because of the time limitation and this is just a snapshot of uh, the zero waste campaign which i have started in 2010 with some of my students now it is actually a flagship and it's income generation to university malaya and if you look at the sustainability achievement in terms of environment we have diverted more than 1 million kilogram of total carbon uh, sorry total waste we have uh, actually uh, offset more than 5 million kilogram of co2 equivalent so this is showing you you know your little effort goes a long way and we have also saved um in terms of um waste disposal costs uh, cost more than almost 400000 and from our uh, humble uh, generation of compost which is coming from our food waste and green waste in um otherwise would be a burden to the environment if it is sent to the landfill we have actually generated more than 40000 uh, income yeah uh, to our tabung eh, in uh, bendahari and uh, on top of that we also have the social intervention where we uh, sponsors through our sales and through uh, uh, you know collaboration with our partners more than 38000 ringgit and more than 12000 visitors uh, students ag agencies uh, government uh, and also private and also international participants have visited and have learned and we do training too eh? so we also have water management water warrior is one of the uh, signature program and other projects including iot yeah and and so on sensors we also have energy management trying to reduce energy use because as you know energy is one of the biggest culprit in terms of uh, emitting carbon dioxide and causing climate change we also have transport management trying to promote sustainable transportation to reduce our carbon footprint yeah uh, using non motorized uh, you know uh, 
promoting walking and so on and carpooling. And we also target green procurement because I think That's green procurement is actually yeah, yeah. very important because it is the coming in of what you bring in to your institution. Okay? And uh, education management. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, pr probably we will we'll have the last one minute. Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, I know that. I'm looking at the time. So, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, be as fast as possible. Change management. And of course, uh, we have been highlighted in the media. And this is a snapshot of a summary of what we have actually achieved. And if you look at, to me, at the end of the day, all our living lab project, because we actually monitor and we uh, calculate, we have actually diverted and offset 15 million, more than 15 million kilogram of CO2 greenhouse gases. Yeah from UM's activities. So we also do a modeling. If all the universities, public universities in Malaysia were to adopt this concept, we could actually save Malaysia more than 4,000 ton of CO2 reduced, and we could actually achieve more than 5 million ringgit to uh, generation and income. So what can you do at any individual level? As I say, there's so many things that you can do. Reduce your water usage, reduce your consumption, reduce your waste, yeah? And there's so many other things that you can do, yeah? So at the end of the day, everyone have a role to play. We need to actually uh, ensure that, uh, of course, coming from the universities, I feel that universities can play a very, very important role towards not just uh, serving as hubs in local communities and so on, but also play a critical role in preparing society to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And with that, I thank you for your time. And hopefully that uh, our message gets across because I think we always talk to the same people who are converted. We should get the message across to more vast uh, society uh, they, so that they also adapt and uh, make changes in their lifestyle because together we must actually uh, share the responsibility yeah, to uh, combating the uh, impending disaster from climate change. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Prof. Sumiani, for that very, very insightful you know, sharing that you have done with us. And you have shown us so much evidence of climate change that is happening right before our eyes. And you have also mentioned that you know, climate change, you know, the impact is very diverse. But one thing for sure, it is very devastating. It is so devastating to every single human being on planet Earth. So I think that is something that you have really you know, opened our eyes to you know, with all the evidence that you have shared with us. And you have also mentioned something on it's actually due to human activities. So it is actually our own actions that actually brought about, you know, such uh, impact of climate change. And, uh, and also you talk about the importance of collective action, you know, from an individual to a collective action that's very essential. And of course, also not last but not least, the importance of the institution of higher learning. What is our role and what can we do? you know, in forest to tackle this issue. So thank you so much for that, Prof. And I'm sure again, uh, I, I like I'm looking at questions now, there's so many questions. So for the benefit of our participants, so if you have any questions, so please put them in the Q&A box that you see down there. We will address the question right after our third speaker have uh, spoken. So now I would like to introduce to you our third speaker. It is my greatest uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Ms. Tan Chai Mei. So uh, Chai Mei actually received her bachelor's, of edu uh, bachelor's education from Soka University of America, uh, specializing in environmental studies, and she continued her master's degree in environmental management, environmental economics, and policies at the University of North Carolina. Young as she may be, she's already playing very active role as the advisor and former media lead in the Malaysian Youth Delegation, or commonly known as MYD, which is a platform for Malaysian youth to advocate for climate action internationally and domestically. At MYD, Chai Mei also communicates pertinent climate issues, organizes forums, and improves transparency of government's actions, uh, climate actions and decisions. And currently, Chai Mei is attached with VERA, an environmental service agency based in Washington that provides standards for sustainable future. So today, Mei will be speaking to us about youth and the future of climate change. Me, the floor is yours. I mean, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Oops. Yes, there we go. Right, perfect. 
So thank you again for the warm introduction. It's very nice to be here today. Um, thank you for taking time of your Sunday to come and uh, listen to us speak about uh, climate change. So yes, as when Dr. Wendy mentioned, I am a senior member of the Malaysian Youth Delegation, a Malaysia-based NGO that informs the public about climate change policy and how we can hold decision makers accountable. And I'm very humbled and honored to be here speaking with such distinguished panelists and a fantastic moderator. So thank you SGM for this opportunity. So I am here to share a little bit about the role of youth in climate action and why we are so important in determining the future of climate change. So when we talk about youth and climate action today, we cannot run away from thinking about the face of the youth. And that face for one is Greta Thunberg. Uh, you've probably seen her face num numerous of times in newspapers, in social media. And she's the girl from Sweden who led Fridays for Future Climate Strikes, basically not going to school on Friday, um, striking for climate action, because why would you go to school if there's not a future to live for? And we see also a number of names and faces in the newspaper. And sometimes we may think that they're fighting separate fights, but in fact, they're not. These are the faces that represent the many youth around the world who are fighting for climate action because they recognize the urgency of doing something today. So now you may ask, you know, who are these youth? Do they even know what climate change is? Even if they're aware of climate change, do they think it's that important? And are they even suffering from climate change right now, you know? So to clear these doubts, I'd like to give you a little bit more context as to why it's such an important thing for uh, the youth group. So here is an infographic that I'm showing um, that actually shows some of the results of a global survey conducted by the UN in 2008. And they surveyed youth around the world. And don't worry, I'm just gonna highlight quick bits that they found. So here it says that 73% of the youth surveyed say they currently feel the effects of climate change already. And keep in mind, this survey was conducted in 2008. So now fast forward in 2020, where we know about climate change a little better and know what actually climate change causes, I bet more people uh, do feel the effects of climate change already. And another thing they pointed out was that 89% of young people say they can make a difference in climate change. And asking, you know, specific in Malaysia, another survey found that 26% of young Malaysians identify climate change as the biggest global issue today. So, oops, going back one slide. You know, this clearly shows that young people already recognize climate change is real, it's happening, and we have, some, we have to do something about it. Um, however, many people, many youth in the world, uh, feel that the world is not acting quickly enough to address this issue. So now I want to present a different angle to look at the importance of youth as a group. Turns out, unsurprisingly, we make up the majority of the world's population. 16% of the world's population are people between the ages of 15 and 24. And if we include those below the ages of 15 years old as well, we make up more than 50% of the world's population, and that's 3.5 billion people. And as you can see in this particular graph, we see that you know, the youth population is increasing, especially in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in Malaysia alone, you know, youth already makes up 43% of our population. So we are the biggest group currently in the world who are going to experience the effects of climate change that is to come. So just now, Professor Maini mentioned that you know, climate change impacts are severe and negative and will become more severe in the future. And you know, bear in mind that the developing world, you know, traditionally labeled as the global south, you know, countries below this crude red line that I drew, drew here, they experience more of the negative climate change effects compared to the developing world, uh, sorry, the developed world, because they have lack of resources, they are less developed, they have less money, and also they're located in areas where traditionally have um, experienced a lot of the extreme weather events. And 85% of young people live in these areas. So their health and safety will definitely be affected. Um, and, you know, these concerns of they have about climate change currently are not being represented in the local context and in, neither in the international stage. So it's important to empower this group of young people to do something about it. So why are the youth so important? Just now I mentioned, we already make up the largest group in society. And I wanna talk a little bit more about how we inspire 
um, people to take action and not just to give people hope that we will take action in the future. So that's why people are out there, youth are out there talking about, you know, how are we going to advocate for the future if not by advocating for ourselves today? And even as times change, as we look at climate change from different perspectives, the core message still remains that we need to ensure intergeneral equity exists. So what is intergenerational equity? Intergenerational equity is a concept that advocates for fairness and justice between different generations. Meaning that since we're disproportionately experiencing negative consequences of environmental damage in the future, what we need to do is to weigh on decisions that affect our quality of life in the future the same way we do today. So for example, let's say Johor Bahru is experiencing increased energy demand in the future. And they say, okay, we need to solve this problem. Let's build a coal power plant. So they're saying, okay, in the short term, definitely we can meet the energy demand that is you know, being demanded. Um, but these decision makers may not consider what serious problems or what issues it may raise 20 or 30 years down the road. You know, people may suffer from health problems because of the pollutants coming out from the coal power plant emissions and also the amount of carbon dioxide released from the combustion process that will actually increase the severity of climate change. So these sort of things, we need to, you know, kind of think about it and value it in a way where when we're doing a cost benefit analysis, you know, how much it will cost versus how much it will gain to the society. We need to think about these things so that we're ensuring a more just and fair future for everybody else. Unfortunately, the system doesn't work that way because 100 ringgit today is definitely worth more than 100 ringgit that you're receiving in the future. So our future is literally being discounted by these um, you know, economic concept of how we assign value and how we put everything in the single number so that projects and you know, infrastructure uh, management and building can move on. So what I wanna say is our future is worth more because we as human beings are worth more. So thinking of today's climate narrative, you know, even though young people have been speaking out about climate action and climate change for a really long time, the spotlight currently is on us because I think the times have really caught up with how important climate action is, especially in 2020. Um, we have urged for climate change today because, you know, you know, seeing all the politicians, they are also urging climate, for climate action in a similar way because they're pledging for more green economies. Um, big companies like Microsoft want to go net zero. And even AirAsia asks you if you want to, you know, buy offsets for your carbon emission if you book that trip to Langkawi or Penang, you know. So how we got to this stage where everybody's kind of on the same stage because um, youth activism basically ask for climate action in very unconventional methods and um, strategies, for example, for organizing strikes. And we've also been able to challenge the system by kind of using the system in the way that what MYD is doing now with doing a lot of policy and engagement work and other youth groups who are actually suing governments for not taking enough action. And many of the youth who have been active for a really long time are currently transitioning into decision-making positions where they can do something about climate change. So what's the response been like after all this you know, action? We definitely have more avenues of participation, but a lot of these you know, opportunities can be very symbolic or superficial just for you know, organizations who provide those opportunities to kind of tick a box. We, we met the KPI for engaging the youth and move on. But let me give you some uh, quick examples of how you know, action and uh, some of the changes we continue to see today persist. So youth activism. I mean, the youth group in general acts as a check and balance, much like other civil society organizations or NGOs that are out there today, because movements are able to lead the change by putting pressure on leaders and hold these leaders accountable for um, what they've promised to do. So things like Fridays for Future, like I mentioned, organized by Greta, the Extinction Rebellion, the Sunrise Movement, these have help, help, sorry, helped hold leaders accountable to what they promised to do. And um, also youth, like I mentioned, have challenged the system. They um, have actually gone to, you know, submit climate lawsuits uh, across the world from Pakistan, Colombia, USA, and Australia to challenge the government, look, we are the future, you're not doing your good job in coming up with policies to safeguard that right to live in a comfortable, resilient environment. And also youth have been able to speak for less represented groups via a lot of platform sharing. 
a lot of the youth groups today actually operate from an intersection between youth and indigenous communities, you know, or asli, youth and environmental justice, youth and politics, et cetera, et cetera. So the youth platform is very strong because it's very accessible to anybody who wants to join. It is nonviolent. It conveys a very effective message that is shared among different communities and different people because climate change is such an important and cross-cutting issue. So another way that youth have been participating in these sort of conversations is to get behind you know, closed doors per se. Um, youth in climate negotiations, you know, we've tried to get our foot in the door um, and we've succeeded in being recognized as an important stakeholder. Um, we've been recognized as an independent actor in the 1992 Real Earth Summit and then lately recognized as an official constituency under the UNFCCC, which is the UN Climate Change Facilitating Body. Um, and NYD is actually one of the 40 plus organizations under Yango. Um, and what that means is that when the UN Climate Change Body calls for a stakeholder engagement meeting, we will be you know, one of the stakeholders along with academia, private businesses, farmers, you know, indigenous people's leaders, you know, youth will be there in one seat and with Yango Malaysian youth delegations able to participate uh, on behalf of uh, that particular seat. So there are a lot of engagement opportunities that come up through attending conferences, you know, delivering interventions and also attending high level meetings. But what is most important is that we don't really, you know, contribute to what the national leaders are talking, you know, amongst themselves. What we do is we write and talk about these issues in our network, and then we bring the important points back to our homes, our local communities, and ask our leaders to do something about it. You know, because young people are the most important people representing their own communities to actually take action and not relying on other people, relying on bureaucracy and other big lofty structures to take action on behalf of them. So I just want to take a short minute to kind of talk about youth activism in the Malaysian context. Um, you know, compared to a lot of other countries, we don't necessarily have a strong representative. We don't have a Greta. Um, what we do in Malaysia, it's more of a collective movement. And that's a very great, you know, sight to see. The current landscape um, of people taking climate action in the youth space, um, primarily made out of climate specific NGOs, like the Malaysian Youth Delegation and also KAMI, um, other environmental NGOs are involved as well, like WWF and Eco Nights. Um, as well as uh, youth NGOs and volunteer groups like, you know, in your universities, colleges, high schools, and like Majlis Belia throughout the different zones. Um, and of course, not forgetting academia as well as uh, other international organizations like the UN. So, however, there's a lot of challenges to kind of be active as an activist in Malaysia um, because some regulation structures may undermine um, demonstrations as an as a effective mode of expressing dissatisfaction and calling for greater actions, which have been effective in other countries like we've seen just now. But there are also a lot of other challenges that the youth group faces in general, uh, um, because, you know, as youth, we are busy with growing and developing ourselves into adults. So sometimes engagements can be very short term and unsustainable. Um, a lot of these liaison work that we are called to do are unpaid. Uh, we are also may be seen as not credible, therefore not prioritized in a lot of these decision making processes. We have a lack of resources and our network is fairly small compared to, for example, private businesses who can lobby uh, government leaders to do something about policy changes. And lastly, the lack of formalized opportunities. Um, and what I mean by that is direct um, access or you know, internship pathways to work closely with a local government on climate change, climate change plans, as well as uh, other governmental agencies, just because that climate change is only starting to be prioritized in these channels. So what matters then? Uh, just now we talked a little bit about individual action and collective action, and definitely individual action is very important. Um, yeah, but, you know, we can only do so much. So the most important thing, I think, is still collective action. Being able to tap into a community where you share similar outlooks on how climate action, you know, should be in the future speaks 
volume. It gains a lot of momentum and people can hear you louder and greater and your message is clear. Um, and that is very important because once you have that, you can increase your personal awareness or your group's awareness by informing yourself about what is the status quo and how you want to change that. And once you are aware, you can communicate that to whoever's in charge, be it in your local community, you can speak to your Adun or your Majis Babandaran and say like, hey, you know, there's a lot of flood coming in in the years, we need to adapt our structures so that, so that we are more resilient. And then to a certain extent, voting for the right leaders who give you the right plans. So most important issue is to act now because climate change is cross-cutting. It exacerbates a lot of the things that we see today you know, affecting water security, food security that ties into poverty, social economic disparity and conflict driven migration as well. So this entire thing basically goes against the idea of what we have as a quote unquote peaceful society. Um, climate change destroys that and we need to rectify that. So last but not least, my personal hope as a youth in society, I think, you know, after everything that I said, I'm still hopeful that things will change because there's growing youth activism and momentum across the world and also in Malaysia. Uh, with MYD, we're really building good policy knowledge and um, pathways so that we can change the status quo. And also there are other youth environmentalists who are at the front lines helping grassroots communities. So um, the environmental field as well is growing very strongly. Um, private sectors are taking action. Governments are paying closer attention to it and international regulations or agreements are falling into place. So I think there's still you know, passionate people who will continue to create the change that we need to see today. Um, but the important thing is not to wait for it to happen because youth should not be the ones bearing the burden of this um, problem. Uh, rather, everybody here today listening to this should think in some way for there's some capacity for them to uh, take action to change the status quo. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for listening. And um, yeah, I hope you learned something from this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was very, very impressive. And you also highlighted to us the importance of, you know, um, the role that youth can actually play in this very significant, you know, issues on climate change. And and I really liked, you know, um, how you ended on a very positive note, you know, um, despite all the challenges that we talk about, you know, the entire morning. But, you know, you mentioned the, the importance of having hope, you know, as long as there's hope. And I'm very sure that, you know, we can definitely bring about, you know, a positive change to this uh, very, you know important issues that we are talking about and of course you know comes with hope we need to work in solidarity we, we need to work you know uh, as a collective community and that's really important so thank you again very much to our three distinguished speakers so now i would like to open up to questions because um we actually receive uh, many questions coming from our very enthusiastic uh, participants today so um i will highlight uh, some of these questions um propose or some of these questions being asked by our participants and um, <clears throat> excuse me okay the first question is um, how is the development of mass waste management system in Malaysia because as I am concerned is that the only way our country manage the waste is only by landfill so how can we change that so probably I would like to um, uh, pass this question on to Prof Sumiani uh, if you could help us address this question on how do we manage waste management given that you know landfill seems to be the only way that we are using it right now. Prof? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, very pertinent question. And also because of my uh, passion towards trying to reduce uh, waste, that's the reason why I started the Zero Waste Campaign in University of Malaya. You see, um, unfortunately, uh, we are very slow in actually moving towards sustainable and also integrated waste management. It's very true. In Malaysia, more than 90%, I would say more than even 95% even of our waste goes directly to landfill. And unfortunately, sadly, most of our landfill, almost 200 of them, 165 actually, only about 14 are sanitary. And when I say sanitary, they have some control. The rest are just pure, merely dumping ground. And you know what happens in a dumping ground. There's no control. There's no mechanism to actually stop any pollution. No, whatever goes to our landfill or dumping ground will just deteriorate. And what happens is it actually emits not just the greenhouse gas, methane and carbon dioxide, but it's also uh, emitting the toxic leachate 
yeah, that will contaminate our groundwater, our drinking water, and our uh, environment. And um, you know, uh, we are very slow to be, unfortunately, still. Uh, even though we have many policies in place, uh, I think one of the biggest challenge is actually implementation and enforcement. So as individuals, what you could do, like I say, if you had showed, seen my slide earlier, I, I, I just push my agenda. I feel that you know uh, everyone can uh, play their role, no matter how small, how insignificant you might think. Uh, when I started, it was almost no support, nothing. But at least you know uh, now it has become a university agenda. And it has proven that you know you can actually that we have diverted as you look at the figures more than a few million uh, kilograms of waste from going to the landfill site so isn't that significant you know collectively over the years although obviously when you start it will be small but if everybody plays their role and at your personal level what you can do is actually very simple relook at your consumption patterns yeah Consumption, uh, of course, we are not the producers, but for our producers, look at consumption and production pattern because, uh, you know, uh, sustainable consumption and production is one of the key areas. Yeah, we, we should try to um, produce less waste. And most importantly, I always try to actually advocate the uh, 5R, not 3R anymore, or in fact, more than 5R, which starts with the first R, which is refuse. So if you talk about waste, the first thing for you not to generate waste is to refuse. Refuse things that's not necessary. Yeah, then you go to the others. Yeah, reduce, reuse, recycle. Those are all already end of part. You should, that, that is the reason why we actually incorporate green procurement as one of our tenants in the Living Lab project. Because what you, need, what you can control when you bring in or you reduce or at least get those that is a more environmentally friendly. And start separating your waste at source. This is very crucial. Do recycling. There's so many programs and push the agenda to your local authorities. I live in PJ. I'm quite grateful. PJ, MBPJ, they are very proactive, but they need to also, I think, not just at MBPJ, but at national level and also local and other local authorities to intensify separation at source yeah, and enforce it properly yeah, and also create this culture of recycling where if you look at the paradigm that I show you, if we were to truly practice recycling, only 20% of our waste should go to landfill. The rest are all not waste because if you recycle and you separate them as source, they are actually resource. Look at my food waste and food waste in Malaysia is more than 50%. If we just take away the food waste from the waste stream, 50% of our waste problem is solved. And that food waste is horrendous because when it goes to the landfill, they are the one that actually causes the most problem in terms of methane, greenhouse gas, global warming, and also leachate production. So I can go on and on talking about it. You know, I take a whole semester to teach about sustainable waste management and so many other issues. But at our personal level, if you're worried about your mass production of waste and our waste going to landfill site, at our personal level, individual level, your family, you can actually influence your community, you know, you have resident association and you yourself are, of course, student or employer of an, of an institution. Start the zero waste campaign, please. At least if you divert food waste alone, 50% of your problem is solved. Yeah, and you can convert it to compost and so much benefit of producing organic compost. And now we are planting and producing organic vegetables in UM from our food waste. Is income generation is good for the soil, is good for the environment, is good for everything. Yeah. Thank Sorry you. if I I I seem a bit more, you know. Thank you very much, Prof. Yes. You know, I think you have actually answered a couple of questions, you know, <laughs> in, in our question chat box where people actually ask about, you know, what can individuals do at an individual yes. level? What can we That's do? That's just from waste perspective, yeah, Dr. Wendy. There's yeah. water jet, water minimization, you know. Exactly. Um, uh, practice, you know, minimization of water, recirculation of water, rainwater harvesting, so many things that you uh, can do. Actually. You know what, I would like to suggest, you know, perhaps after this, you know, uh, we will leave Prof. Sumani's email, you know, so so anyone yeah. who has, has more questions, you know, to ask on what exactly we can do or perhaps even interested to take a course with Prof. Yeah, yes. uh, by the way, just to highlight, uh, our eco-campus uh, secretariat also does training. So if any organizations or any individuals or resident association wants to learn how to do composting, how to do urban farming, how to separate your, you know, simple, we do everything on the eight tenets that we have shown you, we have training programs, very minimal cost, 
but more of trying to create awareness yeah, and uh, capacity building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. You know, uh, due to time constraint, you know, uh, we wouldn't be able to take any more questions, unfortunately. But uh, I think the organizers will actually put down the email address of our three panelists or our three speakers here uh, on the chat box. So uh, perhaps, you know, uh, we can actually address our questions personally or directly to the three panelists or the three speakers. And I'm sure they will be very happy to respond to your email with regards to the questions that you have for them. Is that okay? Yes. Sorry, Dr. Wendy, I think you're on mute. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yes, I'm on mute. All right, so uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for your very active participation in today's webinar. And I would like to conclude by uh, sharing with you again two very important quotations written by Dr. Ikeda in his peace proposal this year, highlighting the voices of two very important groups. Yeah, one is the women group, represented by Dr. Wangari Matai. And the second group is the youth group, represented by Greta Thunberg on their very passionate cry and wisdom in building a sustainable world where all humanity can live in peace and achieve absolute happiness. So Dr. Wangari Matai asserted, I quote, the future does not exist in the future. Rather, it is born only through our actions in the present. And if you want to realize something in the future, we must take action towards it right now. And from Greta Thunberg, during her address at the United Nations Climate Change Conference held in Madrid last year, she said, and I quote, In fact, every great change throughout history has come from the people. We do not have to wait and we can start the change right now, unquote. So with that, thank you very much once again for everyone's active part participation in today's webinar and a very special thanks to our three amazing speakers. And you know what, I could imagine if this is a live, you know, like a face-to-face -face session, we'll definitely be hearing thunderous applause coming from our audience to our three amazing speakers. And I can't thank you enough, you know, for being here, spending your beautiful Sunday morning with us, talking to us on such important topic that affects all humankind. So once again, thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you so much, Prof. Sumiani, and thank you very, very much, Chaimei, for your presence here with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wendy Yi and our honored guests for the stimulating discussions. To quote Ms. Greta Thunberg, you must unite behind the science. You must take action. You must do the impossible because giving up can never be an option. As such, let's do our best, starting from ourselves to overcome the challenges of environmental and climate change for the betterment of future generations. With that, we have come to the end of the 2020 Peace Proposal Webinar. Our final webinar session will be on the 26th of September, which is next Saturday, to discuss the issue regarding nuclear disarmament. For those who are interested, please visit the SGM Peace Activities official Facebook page to register or follow us for more updates. We hope to see you again. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend.